Hi, Sion. How are you? Good. And you? I'm good. So you yeah. you are you are back home in Reykjavik. Yeah, I'm in Reykjavik now. Been here for a month it, since I returned from Switzerland from Zurich. And what were you doing down in Zurich? Uh, there's a writers uh, in residency program at the Literature House there, and uh -huh. they invite writers to come over and spend six months in Switzerland. All expenses paid, and uh, you don't say no to that. So yeah. Yeah, so I had quite good months in, in Zurich and uh, it was great to get to know the country and the people and the literature. They have great literature in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you're gone for a long time like that, I, I associate you so closely with Iceland. Um, and I wonder, do you, do, you, do, you, do, you feel, do you feel your distance from your, your home homeland and do you feel your powers fading or uh, what is your relationship to Iceland when you go off out into the world? Well, it's always strange to go to a place that is uh, far from the sea, let's say. And Switzerland is of course famous for not having any shores, ocean shores that is. And, right. uh, and uh, usually in, 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 let's say maybe three, four months, I realize one day that I'm missing the sea, I'm missing the ocean. Hmm. And even though Zurich is uh, situated by a wonderful lake, uh, a big lake with a lot of boat traffic and, you know, decent waves, decent waves. And, okay. uh, and uh, it turns gray when it's cold and, 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 uh, and uh, the weather is not good. But one day I realized, you know, what I was really missing. I was, I was missing the ocean. And actually, after we had been there for a few, actually just for, for just over a month, uh, two months, uh, we went to Gothenburg. And uh, one night when we were working in Gothenburg, me and my wife, uh, we looked at each other and we realized that we were experiencing the same thing. And it was the taste of salt on our lips because <clears throat> the ocean was near. <clears throat> So that is what I miss when I'm far from the sea, the taste of salt on my lips. Oh, always poetic. Lovely. Always poetic. Yeah. <laughs> always poetic. <laughs> All right, well, so here we're, we're here to talk. I'll show everybody the book again. Sion's Red Milk, his beautiful new novel. Um, and tonight I just wanna have a conversation about storytelling and fascism and nationalism and uh, how we might save the world as storytellers from those things. Um, uh, but first let's start um, with a question I told you I was gonna ask before we got on. So if anyone doesn't know, uh, Sion and I spent a couple of really wonderful days together in Iceland back in the summertime. Uh, I wrote a profile of Sion for the New York Times Magazine. Um, and, and being around Sion is is a lot like reading his books, I found. Stories are just tumbling out left and right, and you never know where a conversation will go. Um, you, you can get into quite intellectual, theoretical conversations that, that then suddenly become very funny and very personal. And uh, so I had a great time reporting, and I had a great time writing the profile. And I think the thing people have asked me about most in my profile was a, a tiny parenthetical sentence that I wrote, uh, kind of just to tantalize people, um, which was about your cat. Um, and, and I just wrote in, in the parenthetical that I, I, didn't, I didn't have nearly the time or the space in this article to tell the, the life story of your cat, Reverend Marcus. Um, so, so many people wrote to me, they emailed me, um, friends asked me, people wrote, a lot of people wrote to me on Twitter saying, please tell us the story of Reverend Marcus. So, <laughs> so just to satisfy people's curiosity, can you tell us a little bit about the famous Reverend Marcus, your cat? Yeah, well, you know, Sam, it's, uh, it's uh, really amazing for me to discover that the great star of the piece was the cat that only got like uh, three sentences and uh, 
And uh, I, I'm very glad you didn't write more about him, you know? So, <laughs> you know, uh, he would have, com have completely overshadowed me if, if you had written right, more. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. But, but I'm glad to tell the story of Reverend Marcus. Uh, Reverend Marcus is this uh, male cat who lives in our house and, uh, and uh, controls not only the house, but uh, the garden and uh, possibly the whole neighborhood, or at least that is the cat's dream and aspiration, <laughs> and he strives for it every day. Uh, he was uh, discovered in a, in a, in a barn uh, as a kitten. He had been uh, abandoned. He was a wild cat, a feral cat, and was rescued as a kitten. But uh, he had already started like uh, finding his own way in the world. So he really took it, didn't take it too gladly to be rescued. <laughs> right, and he was he, not uh, a city cat, right? He, he, he was not a city cat, you know. So this was in the, this was this was in a in a in a in a town in a town a village uh, uh, on a, on the east coast in the east fjords. So he's brought to Reykjavik, and then he ends up in our house. And uh, the person who brought the cat to our house uh, left the cat in the house when he left obviously glad to be rid of the creature because <laughs> Reverend Marcus is a very uh, violent, uh, dom dom uh, dominating uh, creature. Uh, his ego is large and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and as I said, his aspirations are big, but there is this beautiful thing about him, which is his meow. So it seems that he's, he, he, his development uh, in the in the vocal department uh, was arrested uh, during the hardship of his kitten years. So, <laughs> so this vicious cat has the tiniest meow of any cat his size. So when 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 he greets you, he does it once in a while. He greets you when he sees you, and uh, then you get like this. I mean, it's so high pitched I can't imitate it, you know. <laughs> but it's so sweet to once in a while hear this tiny kitten that is hidden somewhere deep in his dark mind. And he's just here in the garden and you met him and you, you've been in the neighborhood, Sam, and you've seen all the cats. There is cat on mm -hmm. every corner, outside every house. And, uh, and uh, there is only one cat in the, in, in the neighborhood that dominates uh, uh, Reverend Marcus. It's a cat, right, right. A cat from the house uh, across the street and uh, and uh, sometimes we have to interfere uh -huh. when, when Reverend uh -huh. Marcus has been dominated too harshly. So this is, this right. is Reverend Marcus, yeah. That's Reverend Marcus, yeah. I remember, I think you said, or maybe I, I'm exaggerating in my memory that, that sometimes people would hear his little tiny, precious, gentle meow and they would, they would come over, come, come over to your yard to try to pet him and you would have to run screaming, no, 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 don't approach Reverend Marcus, he will, he will hurt you. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. Is sometimes sits here out outside the house, you know, looking like a normal cat and yeah, <laughs> tricking people to try to pet him and then he yeah, then he makes them regret it. Okay. The hero <laughs> of a future book, perhaps. Yeah. Reverend Marcus. Um, so let's talk let's talk about red milk. When when was red milk? published in Icelandic and what was it called? Because one of the things I found out in, in writing about you was that your books are almost never called the same thing in English and in Icelandic. Yeah, it was published in 2019 and it looks like this in the Icelandic edition. Mm -hmm. And it's a completely different title. The title is Kortgult Hár Grau Augu which uh, would translate directly as uh, straw blonde hair, gray eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, or 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 how is it in the translation in the in the in the book when the policeman writes his description? Blonde hair, gray eyes is. Mm. A simplified version of uh, kortgult. Kortgult means like then you see like the fields of wheat. You know, you see mm. the 
you see the uh, old uh, German dream of endless uh, fields of corn or wheat, you know, swaying in the wind and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a person with, with a matching hair color Mm -hmm. standing there proudly in the field you know so it, right. it, has, so it's kind of... it, it brings with it like uh, the music of the third reich in icelandic mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and it's just not something that would have survived translation that kind of that kind of reference probably no because blonde eyes the like blonde hair gray eyes you know is uh, maybe just like too simple you know, it, mm. it would be that extra extra thing to set the mind on the right track. So, but you know, I mm -hmm. am actually quite you know uh, quite happy with the books acquiring uh, different titles in different languages. You know, for me, yeah. it's a part of the translation uh, process. It's a part of the uh, of the of the journey the books are making between cultures and and places. So I, I, I've, I've been quite happy with it. Some authors hate it, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to see them metamorphose into another cultural country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, that's, that's a very uh, distinctively Sion attitude to take. And that was something uh, that really interested me when we talked about that, that I, I think a lot of, I think um, something that came out of our conversations and that certainly comes out of this book and your other work in relationship to nationalism, fascism, kind of cultural myths, is that you reject purity in almost all its forms. And um, if you have a kind of radical position, it seems to me, it is an anti-purity position. And so uh, it surprised me at first, but it actually makes per perfect sense that you would not be precious in any way about your titles being translated into something completely different, the language of your novels changing into completely different languages with different connotations. Um, that, that, that is a kind of perfect uh, flowing extension and, and changing of your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you are right. Uh, about my uh, aversion to purity. And uh, it was interesting for me to discover how, how, uh, how big a part it is of me, you know, in our conversation, because I realized over the two days or more that we were together that we were always coming back to things, you know, where, where this was an issue. You know, mm -hmm. and I had a stance that somehow brought me, had brought me to a place, you know, where I'm um, trying to mess things up, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, I think this is, uh, I think biologists uh, would agree with me, you know, that, uh, that uh, the only way for, for life forms to survive is uh, by, uh, uh, reveling in in the mud and uh, <laughs> exchanging uh, mat material uh, on all levels, from from mm -hmm. from from from, uh, from, uh, from DNA to uh, to uh, flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a big wild creative mixing of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, 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 the anti-purity position, we did keep coming back to it in many, many different contexts. Um, and I, I, I'm thinking now of something, uh, I talked to many people who have worked with you or who are fans of your writing um, in writing my profile. And I remember speaking with your English translator, uh, Victoria Cribb, Vicky Cribb, um, had a really great conversation with her. And I remember one thing she said was that, um, you know, your work has such a, a, a playfulness and a kind of buoyancy to the creativity and the invention. And yet something she really loves about you and your work is that there's also a deep anger in it. And um, uh, it makes me think of a, of a, a phrase I came across recently. Uh, I was reading George Orwell, who was writing about Charles Dickens. And he described Dickens 
with a phrase that I thought was really wonderful and that I think applies to you, which is he said that Dickens was generously angry. He's generously angry, um, which I think is a very powerful combination um, that I think also applies to you because it strikes me that you are, you are angry. I mean, you were, in, you were a, a teenage punk surrealist uh, anarchist who was gonna, you know, uh, mess up society and bring everything down. And, and um, that is still very much within you. And yet you proceed with this kind of generosity and creativity tethered to that anger. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, that sounds uh, like a good uh, recipe for, for, for uh, what I'm trying to do, you know? So yeah, I, I aspire to stay generously angry. That's a, that's a good thing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot these days, and I think a lot of people do about, um, you know, we're, we're seeing the rise of, of violent, nationalist, racist uh, tendencies and regimes all over the world, uh, all across Europe, the United States, um, everywhere. And um, I struggle quite a lot with, with trying to find some kind of emotional position where I can, I can be angry and I can use the energy of that anger, but not just kind of self-immolate, not just eat myself up with the anger and still do something. And, and maybe that generosity is the kind of vehicle that allows you to, to keep moving forward. And yeah, but yeah, because yeah. of course one of the one of the phases of the groups that you mentioned is anger. We 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 see the neo-Nazis, we see the astrite. Uh, the characters uh, screaming. We see them with angry faces all the time. And we definitely don't want to be like them. Mm. And uh, it is not good that they have, uh, if they have hijacked anger, because anger is, uh, 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 as you say, is a feeling that we all should be allowed to have. And we should, uh, we should, we, we should be able to express it and find a way of expressing it that is not destructive. So, so uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that they've tried to hijack, you know, that is, that is anger. And uh, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're trying to, to uh, be something else than they are, you know, when you're trying to find a way of con uh, not only confronting what they are, but their ideologies, you know, you, I think there is a tendency for, uh, for uh, those of us who, who, who disagree strongly with uh, their agenda, there is a tendency to to go. I, I'll I'll just I'll, I'll use the word soft. You know, to 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 try to uh, change the tone of the conversation or of the conflict by uh, being soft, being uh, polite, being gentle, you know, and of course we should be all of all of all, all of those things, but uh, they should definitely not be given the idea that uh, that anger be belongs to them and that anger can only be used in this destructive, negative way that uh, that they are doing. And we will never teach them to be polite. I mean, we will never teach them to be polite. We will we will never enter. We will never get them uh, to enter into a real conversation. That is the problem with fanatics. You can dream of having a proper conversation with them, but they will never, they, they will tolerate. If, 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 if they have some restraints, they will tolerate you while you're speaking, and then they will just continue with their program. This is the problem. This is the big problem with fighting uh, uh, fascism and, 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 uh, and these fanatic ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, let's think about this in terms of, of, of storytelling because that's, that's what you do and you're <clears throat> a really great thinker about stories and how stories work. So this sort of fascist view of the world comes with a certain model of, of storytelling that actually has quite a lot of power behind it, I think we have to acknowledge. Um, so what, 
what do you see as the power, first of all, before we get to the, the problems and the weaknesses, what, what is the power of that kind of story, that kind of view of the world? You mean the, 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 the story from the, from the right? The story from the, yeah. from the yeah. fascist point of view? Uh, there, is, there is a promise of uh, 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 a simple, pure uh, uh, world under control. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is always a world that has been taken from you, uh, that you have been robbed of. And uh, there's a promise in their stories that you can get it back, you know. But it is a completely made up world because it is a world that is based on the lie of purity, the, the lie of uh, control, uh, the lie of... Uh, a fixed system, you know. So what they always try to sell you is the idea that there is a fixed system, that there are races, that there is a hierarchy of races. There is a hierarchy between men and women, you know, between the genders. And, 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 um, and of course, there's a hierarchy between uh, nations and, 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 the, and, and, and people who come from the countryside and people who come from the dirty inner cities or whatever, you know, I mean, they have it all laid out. It's, it, it, it's, it's a very visible, easy to understand system. And they will always place you as the victim in that system. And then you get the promise that this will be given back to you and, and, and things will be under control. And uh, they are occupied with the past, obviously, with, 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 a, with all these romantic ideals, you know, that they use as the emotions to fuel this, this, uh, this lie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the heart of it is, 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 is the idea that the world can be brought under control, you know. Right, right, right. And to surrender control, I guess, is, is terrifying for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, we should just start by admitting that we don't have control. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. We've never had it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, the weakness of the kind of fascist storytelling, as you've laid it out, is that it just doesn't match up with reality at all. It's 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 a complete fantasy and takes quite a lot of uh, putting on of blinders so that you 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 don't see all the evidence that contradicts this this story of purity of a of a of an old purity that was taken away from you uh, when you were victimized by some other, and they can frame that other in many different ways. Um, uh, so I guess as a storyteller, how do you begin to fight against um, that fascist model of storytelling? How do you use stories to convince people or show people that, that there's a different model of the world? Uh, well, I think, you know, coming from uh, uh, a culture, Icelandic culture, that for a long while believed uh, in its uh, uh, in its uh, uniqueness and its uh, wholeness and uh, yeah purity, that uh, uh, a miracle had happened here in culture and uh, that uh, uh, it had more or less been untouched by outside forces. Well, we brought the Germanic culture with us. That was a dominant, uh, dominant uh, power culture uh, uh, from the beginning, and then of course you know we we, we nurtured that here in on on our, on our small island, and uh, and uh, this 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 was the self image here for for a long while, and and still is you know there mm -hmm. is still is here you know in, in in many people's hearts. So what you the only thing you can do is to look for stories that. Uh, sort of prove that this is wrong, <laughs> that, 
that uh, show that uh, there have always been uh, many forces at play in our in our culture, and that uh, uh, if anything, uh, the the elements of our culture that uh, that uh, 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 have relied on this uh, on 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 the on the power of this self image of of wholeness and purity or or, uh, or uh, homogeneity, that uh, it is not a benign power, you know, that it's not a benign influence on, 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 on our, uh, on our uh, small, uh, small, really, community here mm -hmm. on, this, on this island. So I look for stories. I look for stories that go against this, uh, the grand narrative of the, of, of, of the national character. Mm -hmm. And Sometimes, it, like in 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 Moonstone, the novel Moonstone, uh, I, I I bring forward a character that, let's say, until until uh, uh, late uh, 20th century, early 21st century, would have been impossible in Icelandic fiction. You know, it's it's a 16-year-old uh, queer kid. You know who 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 is dys dyslexic, who loves uh, cinema, this art form that is coming from abroad, and is seen as like unwholesome and 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 going against you know the the greatness of the Icelandic uh, literary uh, literary culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, so I I I create this character and I bring, or I find this character in history. I I find a possibility, a, a moment in history. 1918, in the, in the days of the Spanish influenza, I find a moment in history for a character that can go against everything the Icelanders think is good about themselves. And I make him my hero. Right. And of course, because I don't like the, 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 the great narratives of the fascists, and that is the problem. The hero of a, of, of a novel that is going against uh, the 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 let's say fascist narratives, uh, the hero can never win. The hero will never conquer the world, you know, but the hero will find a place in that world for him or herself or themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that leads us right into to Red Milk and your discovery of this, um, Little known, I guess, right? Uh, uh, Neo-Nazi cell in Iceland in the late 50s and, and early 60s. This is not something that you had grown up knowing about before you discovered it? No, there was very little talk of uh, the uh, influence of Nazism in Iceland uh, when I was growing up. Uh, there was a Nazi party here in, uh, in, 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 in the 30s and uh, 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 until the uh, occupation of Iceland by, by the British. Uh, and uh, th their story was, 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 was more or less hidden. It was never talked about. And uh, well, when you grew up, you know, and if you were interested in politics, you would start hearing like here and there, okay, this member of the conservative party started in the Icelandic Nazi party. Okay, you know, things happened. They were young, they were confused, you know. They liked the, they liked the uniforms, you know. They liked the German language, you know, and <laughs> things like that. There were all sorts mm. of experiences for these people if, if they came into the conversation at all. And uh, then uh, uh, in the, I think it was the late, 80s or early 90s, there was a book published here about the history of this Icelandic Nazi party and uh, uh, about uh, Icelanders who had gone to Germany in the Second World War. Some of them fought uh, with, uh, with the German uh, uh, army or, 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 or even some of them uh, joined uh, the SS. There was a case that was brought uh, uh, into light in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, early 90s, a case that had been staring everyone in the eyes, and that was actually that uh, the first president of Iceland, uh, his son, 
had been in the SS. <laughs> and he had been brought back to Iceland at the end of the war. And, you know, he was never brought to trial or anything in, in Denmark where he had been, you know, he had been a, a, a part of the occupying force of Denmark. He had run a, an information service there and whatever, you know. So these stories were all around us, but, you know, absolutely more or less invisible. At, yeah. the end, at the end of this book that was published about the Icelandic Nazi party, there was a final chapter, three, four pages about this tiny neo-Nazi cell that operated at the beginning of the 60s. And that was it. And it was treated as a joke, really, that some guys had started this small cell here and okay, it went nowhere, you know. And I was very interested in this because it told me that uh, these ideas, they, they had not been left behind in the 30s, you know, and, uh, and that the, the, let's say the ghost, the ghost of Nazism had, uh, had uh, lived on here as it did elsewhere. And I was just quite interested in, in, in this small group. And uh, for many, many years, I, I didn't do anything with it. It wasn't until I read, uh, I, 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 for some reason, I started looking at it again. And when I realized that the leader of this Nazi cell had actually died just before the International uh, World Union of National Socialists was founded, and that this was, must have been like the great tragedy of his life not to be able to be there because he had been corresponding with his people he had been doing everything to spread the, the evil gospel here in Iceland. He had been supporting their magazines in Sweden and England. And when I realized that this man had died, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the absolute anti-heroic death of someone trying to put down the flag, you know, uh, on, uh, on behalf of evil, you know, that's when I got interested in it. This, 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 you know, that, that I could write a story that had all the elements of a heroic tale, a hagiography really, because that is also a favorite format for, uh, the, the fa for fascist literature. That is the young person who gets inflamed by these ideas and uh, preferably dies, you know, and becomes a martyr. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a format, it's a known format uh, for fascist stories. So, uh, because, you know, they all need to be victims, you know, because only from their victimhood can they, uh, can they uh, justify their violence, you know, that is, right. uh, well, that is one of the things of, about fascism. So, when I realized that this element was in this story, that's when I started working on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the story you tell does hit all those kind of um, signature moments of the hagiography that you were talking about. You know, you have this, this young person who's kind of inflamed with ideas and suddenly is put in contact with what he feels as the truth for the first time in his life and, and, and uses all his energy and all his connections to try to build this movement and remake his, his nation. Um, around these these ideas and and so you do hit all of those all all of those points in the narrative but what's so, so interesting about the way you've done it is the style that you tell this story in um is so deliberately sort of uh flat and neutral almost um that you don't you're hitting all these narrative points but you're not giving the kind of energy to them that a, a fascist text would give to them so that we see them in in quite a different different light so we we feel that narrative and yet also it's quite pathetic rather than inspiring or or heroic i would say um it's quite pathetic and it's also very human so um maybe talk a little bit about how you made this decision to write in this way. Yeah, because usually my text is quite rich, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, th th there is like this generous anger in it. Now now I can always tell people that it's full of generous anger. 
you know, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it takes advantage of like, you know, mythology, poetry, all of these elements. And uh, it was so difficult for me to write this book and to refuse myself, you know, using, use, using these elements. And mm -hmm. I realized that I couldn't use them because whenever I, I, I tried to bring them into the text, it, it, it made the text dangerous in the way that it uh, supported his experience in the wrong way. So it had to be pathetic. It was so interesting. And it was so interesting how little it took, you know, uh, uh, for the text to, to turn against uh, uh, what, I did, what, 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 what I intended it to do, you know. So whenever I brought to any passion or anything in it, you know, I always had to contain it. I mean, it's really like working with a virus. Mm. You know, it has to be in a completely controlled, <laughs> lab, uh, uh, you know, uh, research laboratory environment. That, that's mm -hmm. how I approached it. And it is a virus. That, that is the thing. It, it, is, it is strange, you know, how it, how, how it operates. And, uh, you know, I think the moment in the book when he meets Savitri Devi, who uh, became the godmother the fairy godmother of the world uh, world union union of national socialists uh, there are, there are two parents you can say it's uh, it's uh, george lincoln rockwell and it is savitri devi and she was here in the, in 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 the in the forties after 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 she became a persona non grata in 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 Europe, she came here for a few months, and in the book the very young boy has an encounter with her. And uh, there are two things that happen in that scene. It, it has the hagiographic uh, importance of uh, blessing. She recognizes his talent. She says, "Gunnar Kampen," you know, it means. A, a warrior, you know. Mm -hmm. So she suggests you will be a man of great things. And then she she does this trick with the with the light. She lights uh, the light from a from a from a lamp through his hand and says, "Only white, only on, only the white let light the, let the light in, or or the light shines through them." And the, this is possibly the moment where he's infected, <laughs> if you can see. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But I think in, in all his childhood, in all the childhood scenes, you see that he is surrounded, he's surrounded by these uh, elements. And that is, you know, that is the challenge I'm bringing to the Icelandic reader. It is to accept that Icelandic society from, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from the 30s, 40s into our times. And, you know, in, in, in the case of the story uh, th throughout the, the 50s and the 60s, is still saturated with the fascist ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and you talked a lot about these, these new immigrants to Iceland over the last decade or so um, from Poland and Thailand and other places um, who are bringing up a lot of these same objections from traditional traditional Icelandic people who think Ice, Iceland is for the traditionally Icelandic, again, hearkening back to a kind of romanticized past, right? So this is a conflict that is very alive in modern Iceland. Yeah, and I mean, even, even you know, I mean, it's so interesting uh, that even, you know, in our, in our, in our, uh, in, in, in the sagas, you know, in the, in the Icelandic sagas, if you read it positively, you know, then you realize it's 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 about a multicultural society. There are people coming from Ireland. There are people coming from Norway, from the from the islands of Scotland. Of course, white people, you know, but from different cultures. Some are Christian. Some are of the Irish Church. There are even people from the Eastern Church, you know, and the Continental Church. There are the there are the heathens. You know, it's a multicultural society. But the narrative that came out of it was, we are founded by Norwegians. And the only mention of the Irish was that they went to Ireland and they took Irish slaves, you know. 
So there was really like this Germanic dominant narrative there and that those who were not of the Nordic Germanic stock, they were taken here as slaves, you know, okay. But of course, now we know this is, this is totally false narrative. The, 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 the only real narrative is the multicultural narrative. And mm -hmm. the Sarkas would have been impossible without the Irish and the Christian influence coming, into, coming together with the Nordic, uh, Nordic uh, heathen uh, uh, world system and, 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 uh, and uh, wealth of stories. So today, mm -hmm. so today, you know, uh, if we, if if you know, if people like are still occupied with this idea that uh, we are Nordic, you know, I mean, uh, of course, they will be uncomfortable with the people who are coming here now. But uh, as you know, uh, I am so glad that we are being saved by our saved from ourselves by the new uh, the, the new Icelanders from Poland, from the Philippines, from Thailand, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Latin America, uh, North Africa, you know, we, we, we are getting people from everywhere and they are really saving us from ourselves. Mm -hmm. They, are, mm -hmm. they if... are a living example of uh, why the Icelanders uh, don't need purity. <laughs> right, right. The, I mean, the the sagas themselves were a kind of, as you said, infusion of stories from a multicultural people, a clashing of many different kinds of people who we only see as one kind of people in through through this kind of racial fantasy, you know, that we've been taught to think in. At the time, they would not have been thought of as, as a single people at all. And so now you've got a, a new infusion of, of stories from, from all over the world. So it's kind of a perfectly Icelandic thing. Yeah, I mean, of course, for you in the States, um, a, 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 a community uh, made from uh, people coming from all over, you know, and uh, totally different backgrounds, but coming together to, to live in one uh, society and community, this is what you know, but for us, it is new and it's happening now. And, uh, you know, I mean, okay, I, I like to exaggerate, you know, I mean, and it's the only way for people, for me to, to, to be heard here. But uh, I, I, I go as far as saying that there is only one new thing happening in Icelandic culture. And that is the stories and art and music that is being made by, by, by these new Icelanders. And some of them are not so new. I mean, they are second or even third generation Icelanders, but they are seen as new because they are just now in the last few years uh, coming into, uh, coming into, uh, coming, uh, coming to light in culture. Mm -hmm. and, and, and telling mm -hmm. the stories. That's great. And, and um, like I said, it's the, only, it's the only new thing happening in Icelandic culture. So, <laughs> Uh, okay, we could go on uh, for another couple of days at least, but I think we should stop and see if we've got any questions. Um, so let me see if I can figure out how to look at the Q&A. Q&A. All right. Um, somebody asks, how, how would you say that your interests as a writer have evolved over time? Well, I started as a teenage surrealist, and yep. uh, and uh, I was uh, very occupied with uh, poetry, and I was very uh, I was really a true believer in 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 in, in poetry. I, I believe poetry was the only literary form uh, worth exploring. And I inherited uh, these ideas from Andre Breton, the founder of surrealism, who despised the novel. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I just like took the line from, from uh, old Breton. So I started and as a had, poet. And you had quite a lot of success uh, at, at shocking um, some of the more traditional literary community in Reykjavik uh, with, with your poetry and your friends. 
Yeah, yeah, we were like, you know, uh, uh, let's say, what can you, what, what do you call it? Uh, 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 a small guerrilla group of surrealists here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, before my discovery of surrealism and, uh, and occupation with uh, surrealism was, uh, of course, the Icelandic folk stories. And, and I thrived on them for years. And, uh, but also all sorts of literature that kids read. But then I read The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. And, uh, and I realized that Andre Breton was absolutely wrong in, in believing that the novel could not be as explosive and illuminating as, 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 as the poem. And that really made me want to try to write uh, fiction. And uh, yeah, so I, I went into fiction, but I think uh, maybe because I started as a poet and the poem is made from fragments that come into a whole, uh, together create a whole, uh, uh, my novels uh, took on the form that, that, that they took, you know. So these fragmented narratives that uh, uh, um, somehow, slowly build up to become one book. That is, that is what I learned from poetry. Um, somebody uh, observed in the chat that as they read uh, Red Milk, they were reminded not only of right-wing extremists, but of left-wing extremists that they know as well. And that, and that uh, your portrait could apply equally well to extremists of, of any stripe. Does that seem right to you? Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, I think I achieved that because I did not dramatize or, and uh, demonize or, or, or ridicule the character, you know. We realized that this is a person going through a process that is the same process, no matter if it is uh, fascism, uh, communism, you know, anarchism, surrealism, you know, also the good guys go through <laughs> radicalization. And uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that someone uh, has uh, noted that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because right, because the, we the process is the same. The process is the same, and then of course the good guys will say, you know. But we turned into good guys. I mean, I, I, I'm here as a writer. You know, I'm not talking to you from prison because I broke the skulls of immigrants in in, in a riot at the, in the center of Reykjavik. You know, uh, I believe that surrealism turned me into one of the good guys. You know, but the process is the same. And I think by acknowledging that, we can start understanding how, how people become Nazis. It's not because they're bad people. It's not because they turn into werewolves one night, you know, because they've been bitten by another Nazi, you know. It is a process that we all go through in, uh, uh, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a, it's a kind of, we, we all have something so deep in us that needs to feel we're living a meaningful life and that needs to attach our life to a story of some kind, right? Um, so I guess the question becomes, how do we help people attach to stories that do end you up on the, the good side of things rather than the violent, uh, evil, bad side of things? How, how, do we, how, how do we help nudge people in a better direction. You know, I would obvious, obviously say that, you know, that, uh, that uh, 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 you know, surrealism should be on the curriculum. Mm -hmm. you know, from very early on, you know. Yeah, yeah. What is surrealism, uh, to take that statement seriously, what does, what, do, what values does surrealism hold that, that, that are healthy, that, are, that made you into a good guy, if any? Uh, all power to the imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one thing. And then, you know, I mean, the, 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 you know, 
understanding the interaction between dreams, fears, mm -hmm. the actual world, you know, you know, the outer world, the inner world, you know, that, you know, and, you know, if anything, the surrealist metaphor messed up things, you know, that is the beauty of the surrealist metaphor. Uh, the metaphor had been used as a very easy to understand, but delicately made tool in poetry and literature. Mm -hmm. With a surrealist metaphor, you start bringing together things that shouldn't belong together. Right. And when people ask for uh, ask for uh, the meaning of it, you tell them, go to sleep and discover it in your next dream. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. So I guess in that way, it's a it's a it's it's an enemy of simplicity, um, and and so it 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 moves people toward complexity, toward appreciating and feeling comfortable sitting in complexity and in the juxtaposition of very different things right next to one another. Yeah, and then of course yeah. one of the one of the one of the foundings of the surrealist. Uh, uh, program is love. There you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good place to end. I think we're right. Uh, we're right up against our time. Uh, maybe we could just ask, um, what is next for you? I know I keep seeing your name on, uh, on, on movie this movie trailer, there's like a, there's, you, you, you co-wrote this movie that looks like a Viking uh, action movie uh, called The Northman, right? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Viking film. It's a revenge story based on the world of the Icelandic sagas and the original story of Hamlet. That was the inspiration for Shakespeare's Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And it was a story that was alive in the Nordic culture from very early on. So yeah, I wrote this story and this script with Robert Eckers, the director, and we hope to bring people into a truthful version of the Viking world with all its beauty and uh, conflicts and uh, yeah, the multicultural uh, elements of it as well. And then do you have a new, uh subversive, anti-purity, uh, Icelandic novel percolating in your mind? I do, I do, I, uh, three, three. Three? Yeah. Okay. So, 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 yeah, so, yeah. Icelandic literature will be messy for a while longer. <laughs> great, great. Uh, okay, um, well, we're, hit, we're running on, against uh, eight o'clock here. So I think we have to say goodbye, um, but this has been fun. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to everybody who came and I hope you enjoyed it and uh, go out and practice love in a surrealistic way. And give us a, give a little a pet on the head to uh, Reverend Marcus for us. I will, I will. Thank you for having me and great Thank seeing you. you again. Thank you for having me in Brooklyn and thank you Sam for giving me your time again. Thank you so My much pleasure. Sion and Sam um, for everyone watching. Thank you for being here. And if you haven't yet, go buy Red Milk at the Center for Fiction um, and have a great night. Thanks. <laughs>